Hi, and welcome to the first lecture in fluid mechanics. In this course, we will cover all things regarding fluid motion, from the governing equations, to simplified problems, applications, and even doing some measuring and simulating of our own. This course assumes you have some background knowledge of mathematics, specifically multivariable calculus, differentiation, and integration, and already have some knowledge of hydrostatics. Before we can jump into the study of fluids, we should review how we study fluids. The way we study fluid motion is noticeably different than what you would have seen for solids in a course like dynamics. So, today we learn how to study fluids. First, let's go over what the name of the course, Fluid Mechanics, really means. Fluids are all liquids and gases, basically anything that's not solid. If you were to let the substance sit freely without boundaries and it started to spread out or expand, that's a fluid. It can move relative to itself. Solids generally stay put. Mechanics means the study of motion of objects or particles and the forces that cause motion or are a result of motion. So naturally, fluid mechanics is how fluids move and the forces involved. Air and water, two of the most common substances on the planet, are fluids. As a result, there are countless applications important to humans that rely on fluid mechanics. The drag of your vehicle as you drive to work, how planes fly, the way fish swim, how water gets from a treatment plant to your sink for drinking. All these are governed by the rules we learn in fluid mechanics. But before we get ahead of ourselves, first let's consider how to study fluid mechanics now that we know what it means. Consider a solid. Here it's drawn in a glass representing its ability to hold its own shape. In physics, solid projectiles and the equation of motion are a cornerstone. Maybe you've studied a cannon shooting a projectile off of a cliff and calculated where it would land or how long it was in the air. These are important things to learn, even for fluid mechanics, but we have to think differently about fluids. Fluids include liquids and gases, which both try and take the shape of the container that hold them. An example of fluid flow could be water flowing as a stream. Typically, to represent fluid flow, we draw things like path lines or streamlines. These are lines that represent the motion of the fluid at any point in space, so you approximately can understand where the fluid is headed at that location. Let's compare how a solid projectile and a fluid flow might be different. Generally, solids have a clear object that can be followed. In this case, it's a bouncing ball. In fluids, there is no one clear object that we can follow. It's made up of a continuous blob of stuff but that stuff might be doing different things at any given time or place. In terms of motion, a solid ball all moves as one. If you can track one point on the ball, you can describe the entire ball's motion. Fluids move relative to itself. At any given point in time, a fluid particle might be doing something drastically different from its neighbors. Considering the forces, Solids generate and respond to mostly external forcing. Things acting on the ball from the outside tend to move it. A trademark of fluids, however, are the internal forces it experiences. Particularly because it can move relative to itself, that means it can impart a shear stress and cause localized motion. So, for fluid mechanics we have more forces to worry about. And finally, because we have a single solid object when we consider solid mechanics, we have a clear mass that's defined. This would be the mass of the ball. However, fluids don't have a single object, thus defining the mass at any given point is a bit difficult. As we will see later, this means considering things like density instead. Now that we have a better feeling for the differences between solids and fluids, we move on to how we observe and describe these fluids. The first major thing we do when observing a fluid is we tend to consider it very zoomed in with quote unquote infinitesimally small fluid elements. Fluid elements can also be particles, 
or parcels or control volumes or observation windows, etc. They all refer to the small blob of fluid you're considering at that point in space and time. But we have the question of how far do we really need to zoom in? Consider our stream again with flow nicely following the conduit curvature. Let's try and define a fluid element near one of the corners over a drawn flow path line. In this case, we've intentionally made the window too big. Notice how inside our window, the fluid has changed behavior dramatically. This means it changed direction and possibly velocity. One rule of thumb when we define our fluid elements is that we don't want to have major changes happening in our element. This is because in our analysis, we end up putting all these fluid elements together. So, when we put them all together to describe the entire flow, we have glossed over important details if we've made our windows too big and we're not seeing those small changes. On the other hand, we also can't make our window too small. Here is where the term infinitesimally small gets confusing, because it really isn't infinitesimally small. At some point, if you make your element smaller and smaller, your box only has a few water molecules in it. Then, it becomes very clear there are discrete molecules inside some empty space. Once we see discrete molecules, we break a major assumption called the continuum assumption, which means we assume that a fluid is one continuous blob of stuff. Kind of like a nice smooth line on a graph, compared to the similar graph but with small discrete jumps and points. We need the continuous assumption for many things, and one of those things is being able to apply calculus to our problem. So let's not break this assumption and make our window too small. So, in general, our fluid is observed through many small elements without breaking the continuous assumption, and we assume the size goes to zero so that we can apply calculus. We know how to define our fluid element, but where do we place it in space relative to the fluid? What perspective do we take? Most commonly when learning about fluid mechanics, we fix our observation window in space and we watch fluid as it passes by our window. Generally, there are two main perspectives you can take when you observe a moving system. First, there is the Lagrangian perspective, where you follow the thing you are observing. Second, there is the Eulerian perspective, where you fix your window in space and you watch things go by. There are a bunch of different analogies that help explain these two perspectives, and my favorite is golf. Consider a golfer on the course striking the ball. Maybe this is a golf tournament because we show up as spectators to watch. Our intent is to observe the tournament and to be able to describe the outcome from our observations. Essentially, we need to figure out who wins. If we were a Lagrangian observer, we would follow one single golfer through all 18 holes. At the end, we would know how one golfer scored on all the holes. If we were an Eulerian observer, we would sit at one single hole and we would watch all the golfers in the tournament play that hole. This means that in the end, we know how all the golfers did, but only on that single hole. Now, neither observer knows the true outcome of the tournament because they don't have all the necessary information. No one knows how all golfers did on all holes. To get the outcome, we need multiple observers. We could either have one Lagrangian observer per golfer or one Eulerian observer per hole. Both get you the necessary information, but with differing perspectives. In fluids, we have this exact same dilemma. Our golf tournament is the flow field. We want to be able to describe the flow field at multiple points in space and time using our observations. If we take the Lagrangian approach, we follow one single particle as it moves along a streamline and describe its motion in time. If we take an Eulerian approach, we define a fluid element or observational window, and we watch as flow enters and leaves our view, 
noting the change in the fluid behavior as it passes by. For example, at our spot, maybe fluid tends to slow down, or maybe it starts to spin. Both of these are legitimate viewpoints with uses in fluid mechanics. However, typically in learning fluids, we take the Eulerian approach and we fix our observation window. The reason for this is partly rooted in application. In reality, it's easy to make a sensor that outputs something like flow velocity, and we can put that sensor at a single point in space and analyze the fluid as it flows by. This is an Eulerian point of view where our window is a flow sensor. It's much more difficult to design systems that follow fluid particles in space. Secondly, it's much easier to define the forces on an object with an Eulerian perspective. A major use of fluid mechanics is aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, where we're concerned with vehicles or objects moving through air or water. In these cases, we want the forces that the fluid imparts on our vehicle or object, like the drag on a car or lift on an airplane. So in a sense, we care more about the vehicle or object, which we fix in our observation window, and we allow the fluid to pass by us. However, the Eulerian point of view isn't all good. Particular flaws in the Eulerian perspective are that the math is a bit harder, which leads to more complicated governing equations, as we'll see later in the course. Specifically, we have to work with something like the material derivative, which is a bit tougher to work with than the regular time derivative. Second, monitoring the mass of the system is a bit harder in the Eulerian perspective. At any given point in time, our observation window might have more or less fluid in it than it did before, meaning the mass of the fluid we're watching changes. So what we typically do to combat this is think in terms of fluid density, which is the mass per unit volume, and use that as a conduit for mass in our equations. And that's about it. These are the basics for how we study fluid mechanics. Let's review. We started by defining fluid mechanics and then reviewing the major differences between solids and fluid motion. Solids are a bit easier to follow than fluids, and so we have to study fluids a bit differently to be able to explain them. Then, we defined our fluid element, which is just the particular blob of fluid we're interested in at a given time. This element isn't so big that we gloss over changes in the flow behavior, but not so small that we see molecules and break the continuum assumption. Lastly, we consider how we best observe a moving fluid where we have the option to follow the particle with the Lagrangian approach, or watch particles go by with the Eulerian approach. Generally, we take Eulerian's perspective. And that's it. Now, we should be ready to jump into the conservation equations of fluid motions, and dig into what really governs how fluids move. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.